Hello, misfits. This is Kale. And this is Kate. Welcome to Horrorwood. Okay, I think we need to start over. <laughs> A dead air there. It's okay. I know, I was, like, going. Preparing myself to <laughs> say it very slowly and eloquently, and and you mastered that definitely. Thank you. Thank you did so a great much. job. <laughs> uh, so I okay. I realized since you've been so Kaylee is staying at my house this weekend, and I realized that the entire time you've been here, we have not once discussed Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And I know it's like all over everywhere right now. And I don't know if you watched the trial, but I did on Law and Crime and was like glued to it. And I just wondered, do you, like, did you watch any of it? So that's a negative ghostwriter because I was working with students the whole time. But oh, I true, did true. have a, a behavior technician or a BT or an aide in our classroom who was extremely tuned into it. Oh my God, and I was hooked. When they gave the results of the DNA, just kidding. Uh, the um, <laughs> like, the jury. What? When they give the results of the jury, she made an entire um, like announcement. It was great, actually. I, it was all on text because we have a text oh, okay. thread because we're not all in the same place at the same time. But yeah, it seemed like a joyous occasion for her, so we celebrated. And I didn't I even was... really know what I was celebrating. I was like not really on team either. Um, oh, I, I was like definitely a... teamed up. I, I mean, I do love a good pirate. <laughs> I will say, oh. well, number one, I just thought it was a good example to show that, like, hey, men can be victims of abuse as well, which I it's just not talked about as much. But there was also this one part um, in her testimony. First of all, she was so not credible. But there was a part in her testimony where uh, one of the attorneys was asking her, was saying, like, I think it was Camille Vasquez who did it, where she said, so... When you had those pictures taken, you put makeup on to make it appear like you had a bruised face, right? And Amber Heard was like, no, I used makeup to cover the bruise. And Camille Vesca said, and can you walk us through how you did that? And, or, you know, something to that effect. And Amber Heard goes, well, first I did foundation and then I put on concealer and then I used a bruise kit. Oh, and, and, and not, not a bruise kit, a uh, stage makeup kit. Uh, I, it I call a, it my bruise kit. It was a legally blonde moment. Oh, my God. It's I the was perm. Like, I was like, there are bruise kits. Like, that is a thing that exists to make yourself look like you are bruised. So I just felt like, oh, my God. Like, no one was buying it. And, I, and like, oh, I was just wow. like, I hope everyone on that jury realizes that, like, stage makeup, is that's only used to make a bruise not to cover one it was just like it was insane anyway I just had to to bring that up because well I guess she was heard <laughs> there you go um but we're not talking about that woman today we're talking about a much cooler woman uh this is part two of Marilyn Monroe and just to refresh your memory of where we left off in part one so Marilyn had just changed her name from Norma Jean Doherty to Marilyn Monroe. She wanted to improve her acting skills. So she was constantly taking acting and singing and dancing lessons. She was reading books. She was a voracious reader. She, at the time of her death, I think they said she had over 400 books in her personal library. Like she read and she was like reading hard shit. I mean, she's reading like Freud and all this stuff like so don't let's not underestimate Marilyn Monroe. We will not discredit her intelligence. No, nope. but I am wondering where in the timeline is this? I mean, she didn't. She, she she died at a younger age, and so I'm just wondering where we are with her in this. She's in, in this, her early twenties. Early twenties. Okay. Yeah, because right. she divorced at 19, but she oh, was right. still carrying around her married name. Uh, but we're like very early twenties here. So, uh, she. She was attending parties, as we learned about in part one, in the hopes of getting noticed. But she found parties boring to her. She just felt like it was a part of the job. 
And it was around this time that she befriended. Okay, his name is, it's an, it's kind of unfortunate, the name. It's Joe Skink. I just have a hard time saying it. Um, he was the co-founder of 20th Century Fox, where she was under contract. And there are a lot of rumors out there that say she and Joe were an item. But according to her, they weren't. He, she said he never tried anything with her, that they were truly friends. So, I mean, rumors are rumors. Like, who knows? But I'm just going by what she said. Um, by the way, for for these episodes, so I used two like main sources and then some websites. So I use the book, my story. Um, it's by Marilyn Monroe with Ben Hecht, which you have to read because it is, it's basically just her telling about her life up through her marriage to Joe DiMaggio. And it's fascinating. It's so, so good. And then the other one I used is called Fragments, and it's a compilation of letters and poems and things that she wrote that they've, these editors have compiled into a book. And that really gives you a look at like inside her mind. Um, and then I used biography.com because they just have a lot of good information. So I'll link all of those in the show notes, but they, it was fascinating. So despite her friendship with Joe Skink, who is co-founder of this studio, Marilyn did not hit it off with the other founder of the studio, Daryl Zanuck. Zanuck actually fired Marilyn from the studio, from the studio because get ready for it. He didn't feel that she was photogenic. Oh, very interesting, considering she is like a pinup. I mean, like, what can you? Okay, so not only that, he cut her out of all the movies she had bit parts in and told her she might be an actress eventually, but her looks were definitely working against her. Can you imagine being the guy who fired Marilyn Monroe because you didn't think she was photogenic? Coulda, shoulda, woulda. So Marilyn was devastated when she was fired, obviously, not only because she lost work, but also because she had learned at an early age that her looks were what got her attention. And she was like, well, how do I change how I look? Like, if that's working against me now, like, Where what do I have? Where is this sweater in this scenario now? I think at this point, she had ditched the sweater because she left that, you know, she left that family because she had right. to get married. So I don't know, maybe that girl wanted her sweater back. So she she goes to her buddy, Joe Skink, and she says, Joe, Joe, Joey, Joseph, what do I do? Maybe this whole acting thing isn't right for me. Maybe I just don't have what it takes. And he told her, don't you dare give up. You've got to keep going. Unbeknownst to her, he ends up calling in a favor to another studio, asking them to hire her. And he tells Marilyn, hey, you should call this other studio, see if they have any work for you. So she doesn't know that, like, he's set all this up. So she does. She calls that studio, and they end up hiring her as an extra for several projects. So she's making a little money. And then the head of that studio calls her into his office, and she's like, this is it. This is my big break. So she was really excited. She goes in for the meeting, and the guy says to her, well, there must be something special about you for Joe to recommend you. Yeah. Something special. And then he says, come spend the evening with me on my yacht tonight. I can make you a big star. So what does that mean? He was just another scumbag. And because Marilyn wasn't about that life, she turned down his offer. She said when she walked out of his office, she felt like she had ruined her chance of ever becoming a star, which props to her because there are plenty of women who would have gone through with it either because they wanted to or they felt they had to. But she didn't. She walked right out. And as she drove away from that meeting, she thought to herself, there is something special about me. I'm the kind of girl they find dead in a hall bathroom with an empty bottle of sleeping pills in her hand. Oh. That is what she said. There is a theme going on with her foreshadowing. Given how she was found at the end of her life. So for Marilyn, though, things were never entirely bleak. She said, and this is also a really interesting quote, she said, when you're young and healthy, you can plan on Monday to commit suicide, and by Wednesday, you're laughing again. So again, interesting. Shortly after the incident with the scumbag studio head, she received a call from the studio telling her she had a check for $40 to be picked up, which today would be around 500 bucks. 
So she was stoked. Um, which today would be, oh, sorry, let me not read the same line twice. And it was around Christmas time, and she was really happy because it meant she could afford Christmas presents for her Aunt Grace, which is just so oh, pure. Aunt Grace, like, yes. she's back. She's back. And Marilyn just wanted to be able to treat her, you know? And she was so excited that when she picked up her check, she left the studio forgetting to cash it. So I like, I guess there was a place you know, where performers could cash their checks right there. So she's walking along the street and sees a policeman and asks if he knows where she can cash her check. And he's like, sure, there's a store right up here. So he walks her to the store and they, you know, they're making small talk. He's like, what do you do? Oh, you're an actress. Cool, cool, cool. And they just have a lovely little chat. So they get to the store and the store manager says, sure, I can cash your check. I just need your name and address on the back of it in order for me to cash it. So Things have changed these days. I mean... So she writes down her info, and at the time, Marilyn was staying at a friend's house because they were going to be out of town for a few months, so she's basically house-sitting. So she gives him that address, and even though it was temporary, he's like, that's cool, and he cashes it and hands her the money. So she leaves the store, super happy and excited. She does some Christmas shopping. She gets some things for her Aunt Grace, and then she decides- sensing some creepiness come through. Some creepiness is coming through. So- First, she decides to stop in at a doctor's office because she had a bit of a cold. Because, again, like, it's, you know, the weather's changing a bit, even though it's L.A. Like, you know, it's things are changing in the air. So she tells the doctor, hey, I have this cold. It's keeping me up at night. What can you give me? Because, you know, when you have a cold, like, it's the worst. You can't breathe. Your nose is all stuffed up and you're just miserable. The nasal drip. The nasal drip, which I feel like I have daily anyway. (laughs) And in Marilyn's case, you know, NyQuil wouldn't be invented for another 20 years. So the doctor says, here, I want you to take these sleeping pills. Don't usually recommend them, but you haven't slept in so long. A good sleep will help your cold. So from what I could find in my research, this seems to be the first time she was prescribed sleeping pills. So Marilyn goes back to the house where she's staying. She takes a pill and dozes off. And then after sleeping for a few hours, she is awakened by someone cutting the screen of her bedroom window. That is that is a night terror I have. Oh, it's terrifying. And she's again, she's like alone in this house. So she runs out. She sees she runs outside. She sees a man climbing into her bedroom window. So, and I have to give her credit for this. She tries to her best to imitate a gruff male voice and she's like Hey, what are you doing here? And the man turns and looks toward her direction. But it was dark, so he couldn't really see her. So then she says, Get away from here. I'll call the police. Like, I feel that's what she sounded I like. I might be trying that tonight. And this is when the man climbs down from the window and starts running toward her. Oh, no. Because she was wakened from a dead sleep. Marilyn is only wearing like a half nightgown, like kind of like a cami, you know, that came just below her waist in underwear. She's barefoot because she didn't have time to put on shoes. And now this guy is chasing her. So she takes off running. Your face right now, Kelly. <laughs> I know. You got to give it to this girl. I mean, she is, she's a beast. I, that's the thing. Like she's she a fighter. She fights her way all the time. She does. So she goes to a neighbor's house and she starts screaming and pounding on the door and a young couple answers. And well, you know what? I say that they're a young couple, but I actually don't know how old they are. They're just a couple. (laughs) So, so the, um, a man and a woman answer and Marin, Marilyn tells the man, Hey, this, this guy just broken into my bedroom and is chasing me. Can you, can you go after that guy? And the man was like, um, no, he probably has a gun. I'm not getting involved with that. But they did, however, let Marilyn in to call the police and told her she could wait at their house until the cops came. I feel like this is a movie in the making. I think that Marilyn could actually script her own movies. And it's too bad she didn't have the chance to because she already has I mean, so right? many stories that I know she could put out there that I feel like actually probably are out there. So most of these movies that have already been made probably reflect her life. I mean, it's wild because... Like, I used to live in L.A. I lived in L.A. for like eight years, nine years, something like that, alone. And 
my like I was terrified of someone breaking in because I do you remember my last apartment in Eagle Rock and yes. it was like there was that sidewalk like right out by the balcony and so my bedroom door was right there it was just a sliding glass door and then my living room glass door was there and anyone like it was level with the and you know the, people walking yeah and in fact let me just pause to tell a little story please uh, do when your first place that you lived in LA, I came out and visited you. It was I'm questionable at most. Wait, oh, I I know that place. It was, was I question- sleeping on the air mattress on yes, the floor? You were. Yeah, it was questionable <laughs> at most. But uh, I will remember I went to I went on a run because I think you had to work. So I was like, heck yeah, I'm in LA. I'm gonna go on a run. I went on a run in the neighborhood, and there was a point where there was a. I th- I think was a woman. She was like in a moo okay. on the ground. Oh, with a paper bag next to her, and okay. she appeared to be dead. And I'm pretty sure she was because there were oh flies god. all over her. Oh my god! And there was like a little bit of tape around her, like like a police had come out there, but there was nothing. I mean, it was like, well, why didn't you take away the body? I'm so confused. What's happening right now? Wait. So they they had like police tape around her well it wasn't really police tape it was like it wasn't even around her it was just nearby like maybe that uh convenience store that was close by had been broken in before I mean it was a pretty sketchy neighborhood yeah yeah yeah. if you remember right uh yeah and I I like kind of paused and I looked to see if she was breathing and people were just walking across her arm and I'm like whoa this is LA that's terrifying this is the land of La la goodness. Uh, I mean, I of- I definitely saw some shit when I lived there. Maybe we'll talk about it at some point because, damn, I let's just say like I'm I'm cool that you know I had that experience and moved I'm on in a different point in my life. So, but it doesn't <laughs> shock me. I mean, just you know, people get in their own realm of things, and and people don't always help. You know, Mister Rogers said, "Look for the helpers." And that's well, what they were not here, for. but 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 they were not in this story, and they weren't. I, I never saw. I was like, "Where? Oh, th- this woman's dead." Oh, wait till you hear about the cops that come oh, to help no. her. So, so it took them an hour to arrive. Marilyn's chilling at this couple's place, waiting for the cops to show up. An hour later, they finally do. They escort Marilyn back to the house, and by then the guy was gone, obviously. So the cops like. Oh, you scared him off. You could go back to bed. And she's like, oh, what if he comes back? He knows the address. He's like, oh, that never happens. Just relax and go to sleep. Just relax and go to sleep. Like someone just broke into her bedroom and started chasing after her. And these cops are like, meh, no biggie. Um, I mean, I no guess I'm sir. not shocked there, but. <laughs> no, sir. So right then, you could not have cued it better. There is a pounding on the door. And one of the detectives tells Marilyn, go open the door. What the hell? Uh, Yeah. Like, he didn't even open it for her. He's just like, yeah, go open the door. Um, Okay. So Marilyn opens the door. And standing there is the same man that had broken into her bedroom. And he immediately grabs her. So the two detectives finally jump into action and grab the guy and restrain him. And they're like, who the fuck are you? And the guy's like, oh, I'm Marilyn's old friend. Tell them, honey. So he calls her by name. And she tells the cops, "Ah, yeah, he does look a little familiar, but I don't know who he is. So the cops say, tell us the truth, Miss Monroe. Like, now they're accusing her. Right. They said, is this an old sweetie of yours? He's clearly not a burglar. He knows you. So while the first cop was questioning Marilyn, the second starts searching the man and found a revolver in his pocket. And he said, this is a police gun. Where'd you get this? And that's when Marilyn realized who the intruder was. It It was the fucking policeman that walked her to the store to cash her check. That's how he knew her name and address. So she tells the detectives this, which the guy denied. But then they found an LAPD card in his pocket and they took him away. So the next day... The detectives paid Marilyn a little visit and told her that the man was a new cop with a wife and a baby, and they'd prefer she didn't file charges because it would look bad for the police force. 
What? What the fuck? Like these these cops. Slimes. I can't so they assured her the man wouldn't try it again or on her or any other woman. And so she didn't file any charges. But she immediately moves out of that house and began renting a room in Hollywood and became very depressed. She just stayed in bed for several days and nights without even moving. She just cried and stared out the window. I mean, think about everything she's overcome at this point. And now exactly. she, she feels unheard, unbelieved. I mean, th- the poor woman can't even catch a break. Exactly. Things wouldn't stay shitty for long, though. Please say that about my life. <laughs> <laughs> things, things were going to turn for her because while she was sitting at a lunch counter one day, someone told her the movie Love Happy was looking for a girl to do a bit part. So she ends up meeting like with the, the producer of the film, Lester Cowan, and he introduced her to Groucho and Harpo Marx, who were both Whoa. in the film. So the bit was that a woman would walk past Groucho in an office and he would have like whatever his reaction was. And, I, and she'd say a line or two. That was it. That was the whole part. And so somewhere. She, she goes in for it and Groucho asks her, well, can you walk? And Marilyn, Marilyn was like, well, yeah, you saw me walk in here, duh. And he's like, well, this role calls for a young lady who can walk by me, quote, in such a manner as to arouse my elderly libido and cause smoke to issue from my ears. <laughs> and she was like, sweet, I've got this. She's like, I've been practicing walking and posing on the regular in my apartment. So she walks Yeah, I need to go them. do that. I mean, start practicing posing like a queen. Why not? So she walks past him and Harpo marks. He had a, a, a horn at the end of his cane. And when she did her walk, he honked it three times. He was like, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> First of all, I'm really envious that I didn't think to put a horn on the end of my cane when I just. Oh, had you my- should have my uh, medical, my injury here because I had mobility devices for so long. Oh my God. That would I would be amazing. honking. Oh, <laughs> I did have, have amazing. I did have a compass and a telescope on my cane, but the horn could have really like <laughs> been the coup that, de gras there. Yeah. It would. Oh man. So Groucho says, you're hired. We shoot the scene tomorrow morning. So when they shot the scene the next day, which was little more than a featured extra, honestly, I mean, it was a small role. The producer, Lester Cowan, told her, you know, you've got that it factor and I'm going to make you a star. There's some happy She love. literally had two lines in the movie. And you can watch it on YouTube. It's very short. She walks in, says, I'm going to do it in my best, Marilyn. And everyone that's listening is going to be like, shut the fuck up. But she walks in and she says, Mr. Grunion, I want you to help me. How was that? That was really good. Okay, good. I practiced. Thank you. Groucho Marx responds and then she says... Some men are following me. If you don't, if you don't use that voice for our dinner this evening, I'm going to be <laughs> really upset. I'll try to talk that. I'll I'll order the food that way. Okay, all right. It's a deal. Groucho responds, and then she exits, and that's the whole scene. So, she, uh, there's an interview with Groucho Marx too, and she was paid a hundred dollars for that, which at the time was like. Uh, about 1150 if you put it in today's terms. I mean, $100 is, is still a lot of money to me right now. Yeah. And Lester Cowan, the producer, he offered her that same amount uh, per week to travel the country and promote the film. She had a bit part and she is suddenly the face of the movie. va va like, boom. Her name doesn't even appear on the original movie poster. Like, that's unheard of. And she is the one promoting the film. And she's making, like, almost 1200 bucks a week for it. Catching so, that break. She travels all over the country. She's posing in various locations. And it was the middle of the summer when this was going on, so it was super hot. So often she would pose in bathing suits. And they would caption the photo, Marilyn Monroe, the hottest thing in pictures, cooling off. So that became the theme of the tour. The hottest thing in pictures. That's going to be the theme of my tour this summer too. I yes. I might have to do a body double, but other than that, it's no, out you, there. No, you are the hottest thing. You are the hottest thing. 
But Marilyn was getting frustrated because she still hadn't been paid. So she they, they keep promising her like, hey, the check's coming, the check's coming. But she still hadn't seen any money. So she requested to end the tour and return to Hollywood, which, I mean, good for her. Like she was just sticking up for herself, you know. She was gaining momentum. She got a small part in The Asphalt Jungle at MGM. And then she got a small role in All About Eve. So her star was on the rise. Her name starts appearing in magazines and newspapers. And she was getting fan mail by the truckloads. Like at the studio, all this, like people would come out and be like, what the? Because all these trucks are there with just like buckets and buckets and buckets of mail. You know, that's Marilyn interesting. Monroe. I want to correlate that back to the mailman. I mean, I do like that connection. <laughs> um, then some photos came out. Remember that oh, uh, little yes. photo shoot from part one? She posed nude to make $50 so she could get her car back that had been repossessed. That's well, right. The photographer that took those pictures sold them to a Chicago-based company that made a calendar from them, which caught the eye of Hugh Hefner. He purchased, H-H in the house. <laughs> he purchased the rights to the photos and used them to publish the first issue of Playboy without Marilyn's consent. consent. Mm. He never paid her a dime and never asked her permission. In Is fact... This- no, Is this where ahead. the word like paparazzi comes in? Kind of like, I know that's chasing, you know, people and getting their photograph, but really like it started somewhere. So, you know, that's interesting. I should look up that. the origins of paparazzi because I don't actually know. Um, so in reality, Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe never met. Like wow. people often say like, oh, Marilyn, you know, posed for the first Playboy she didn't. She never posed for Playboy because those pictures were used without her permission. And she said she never even got a thank you from him. What a rat. Yeah. She even had to buy her own copy of the magazine just to see herself in it. Damn. Yeah. So also side note, in 1992, Hefner bought the burial plot right next to hers and said, quote, spending eternity next to Marilyn is too sweet to pass up. GTFO. Like, That's ridiculous. Like, exactly. Fuck right off because he was, I mean, Hugh Hefner was a shit and we're going to do an episode on the Playboy Mansion and like all of that shit. But yeah, he, and there's like a picture of it with his plot right next to hers. And I'm just like, oh, you fucker. Anyway. So the execs at 20th Century Fox were pissed about the photos and told her to deny that they were authentic because they were worried about quote her image but like let's be real they were worried about their own image right and she was like no i'm gonna be honest so she admitted she had posed for the pictures and the public cheered her on and admired her for her honesty once playboy started circulating marilyn was in high demand high demand very very high demand she got Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and How to Marry a Millionaire, both at 20th Century Fox, which ironically was the same studio she'd been fired from for not being Before. photogenic. And look how that turned around. She also got you a know, raise. Karma. Yep. She also got a raise in her salary and began making $1,200 a week, which today would be about $14,000. So she had arrived, as they say, killing the game. But Marilyn referred to herself as a Hollywood misfit, um, which, hey, we get it. We're all misfits. She just wasn't into the whole Hollywood scene. She didn't care for parties. They bored her. And she felt like everyone there was being fake, which, yeah, I get that. I've been to some Hollywood parties. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) she was notorious for being late, which drove people nuts. And she made an effort. And I use that term loosely to change and try to be more punctual. But she said the things that made her late were just too pleasing. So, That's right. It's fashionable. <laughs> so one of those things was soaking in a bathtub. Oh, my God. She is that. You know what? She's my Shiro. I know. Right. I love taking a tub. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you should take to the tub today. I'm thinking about it right now. Seriously. Now, now you've got it in my head. I might have to do that later. She would sit in the bath for an hour or longer, like an hour or longer. And she'd pour perfumes in the, to the tub to make it smell good. Like a little aromatherapy, if you will. I might be having to change my name. Then get this. She would drain the tub 
and refill it with fresh water and then soak some more. Yeah, because sometimes when you take a tub, you kind of feel like you got a film on you and you need to rinse that off. Yep. I know, I know. Listen, California's in a drought. Trust me, I live there, so I get it. But I do enough for conservation to every once in a while get that bath in and then do a shower rinse off um, with eucalyptus because I do feel like you got to rinse it. You got to rinse it. You got to rinse it. And and, and you got to live your best life and, you know, treat yourself. Okay. And she did. After today, I'd like you to call me Kaylee Monroe. I'm feeling it. I'll try. I'm feeling her. I'll try. Okay. She said it wasn't Marilyn Monroe in the tub. It was Norma Jean. And she wanted to give Norma Jean a treat. Because remember, as a child, she had to bathe in water that six or eight people had already used. So the fact that she could bathe in clean water and make it smell like perfume, she couldn't get enough of it. Then when she'd get out of the tub, she'd spend another hour rubbing creams into her skin. She was the queen of self-care before self-care was a thing. As she became a better actor, Marilyn decided she wanted to become more educated as well. She felt that when she'd go out to dinner with friends, she couldn't really keep up with the conversation because, and these are her words, quote, she didn't know anything about books, history, art, sports, or politics. So... She enrolled herself. That's what in, was talked about then, too. Yep. She enrolled herself in USC. In the book, My Story, she says it was USC, but I've seen it reported elsewhere that it was UCLA. So mm, I don't know. A university. She, la- she was taking university classes. True. Let's yeah. just keep it up. She that. later says US- UCLA, but in my story, it's USC. So we're going with it. She went to school every day. Like she would be on set during the day, go to school at night, like whatever she had to do. She took an art course, then got into psychology. Never underestimate a blonde, okay? Just let's true put that story, out there. true story. And she just wanted to read any book she could get her hands on, so she was really getting after it. She was also, you know, working regularly during all of this, so she'd be on set for hours before she had to go to class. So she didn't really have much time for a social life. And as the demands of her career took over, she unfortunately had to leave school. She felt tired all the time, and she just felt like she was becoming dull. Then one day, a friend of hers at the studio, (coughs) sorry, I didn't want to clear my throat, and then I had to do it. I'll try to mute myself next time. Then one day, a friend of hers at the studio mentioned that Joe DiMaggio was in town, and there was going to be a small dinner party that he'd be attending, and she should go. But Marilyn didn't even know who Joe DiMaggio was. And she said, he plays football or baseball or something, right? And her friend was like, oh, girl, we got to get you out of this work tunnel you're in. But Marilyn wasn't feeling it. She said she had no interest in meeting him. And when her friend asked why, she said, I don't like the way athletes dress. I don't like men in loud clothes. (laughs) Loud clothes. (laughs) I mean, okay. (laughs) I don't think she must have seen their backside then because... A man in <laughs> a baseball uniform and the tush behind it. You're Whoa. into it. You're into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Marilyn's friend finally convinced her because, you know, Marilyn needed to get out. And so she gave in and agreed to go to the dinner. She was late, as per usual. <laughs> when she saw him, she said she was surprised at his appearance because he was very reserved. So I guess he was not wearing loud clothes. Yeah. She said he wore a gray suit with a few blue polka dots in his tie. And she said he looked more like a congressman than a ball player. So she was kind of into it. She okay, introduced okay. herself and he said, I'm glad to meet you. And that is the only thing he said to her for the rest of the dinner. She is literally sitting right next to him, and they did not talk. There were others at the table, and DiMaggio was, like, really quiet just listening to them talk. So Marilyn decides she's going to strike up a conversation with them. So she turns to him, and she says, I love this. She says, there's a blue polka dot exactly in the middle of your tie. Did it take you long to fix it like that? Note to self, that is my new pickup line. I cannot wait to use it. <laughs> he didn't even answer her using words. He just shook his head. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> but despite him being so quiet, Marilyn said he was the most exciting man at the table because all the other guys were trying to show off for him, but he didn't have to show off because he's Joe DiMaggio. And Marilyn was used to men in the film industry who, sa- who she said never seemed to know when to shut up. So she Mm, was mm -hmm. captivated by Joe and immediately felt an attraction to him. But since he wasn't paying any attention to her, she was kind of getting tired of it. So she's like, I'm going home. So Joe. Yeah, because we girls, we get bored. It's like, okay, 
It's intriguing to hear the pause. And then it's like, come on and talk to us. I mean, yeah, you got to give us something, fellas. You got to give us something. Or ladies, depending on your orientation. So Joe offers to walk her to the door. When they get to the door, he says, I'll walk you to your car. They get to the car and he says, you know, I don't have transportation. Would you mind dropping me at my hotel? So he just bailed on everyone at that dinner. Like he doesn't talk to her the entire night. And then suddenly he's like, hey, can you give me a ride? (laughs) And be like, um. So Marilyn agrees to drive him, but she was bummed because his hotel was only five minutes away and she didn't think she would ever see him again. Yeah. So as they approached the hotel, she slowed the car down to a crawl to prolong the trip. And then he says, you know, I'm not ready to turn in. Would you mind driving around a little while? Which, okay. Oh, a good drive. So part of me is like, dude, like, why are you putting this on her and making her drive your ass all over the city? But then like, a part of me is like, okay, I get it. Cause she wanted to spend more time with him, but it's just weird. Like he doesn't talk to her. It's a little her. endearing, right? It's a little endearing, but guys are just awkward. They, sometimes they just, they're clueless. I okay? mean, oh, this one. So she was stoked. She was so giddy. She said her heart jumped and she was full of happiness, but she wanted to play it cool. So she just calmly nodded and said, it's a lovely night for a drive. I cannot wait to use these pickup <laughs> lines. Like it's one after another. I'm going to have scores of men after me. I can't wait. They're going to be lining up, Kaylee. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's like in high school when the person you're crushing on asks you out and you don't really want to seem eager. So you're like, play it all cool and nonchalant. And then you immediately run and tell your best friend. Like it, she was like, she had that like giddiness about her, you know? So they end up driving around for three hours just talking. Oh, it's like, it's like that. It's like when you catch a guy or a gal, whatever, and you can't hang up the phone from them or you can't stop the date. It, you just want it to keep yeah, going. Yeah, like that is like those are some of the best moments. There were fireworks. They were hitting it off. So they dated for a year and a half to two years after that. And then they got married. But unfortunately, their marriage only lasted nine months. Joe was very conservative and controlling. Mm -hmm. He made her change the way she dressed because he didn't like that some of her clothes were a little revealing. So he told her to wear tops with high necklines. And for the most part, she did. Like she was trying to make this marriage work. And oh boy. He also didn't like all the attention and publicity she attracted because at this point he was retired. So his career is winding down. Uh, Hers was on the rise and he did not like that. He wanted a mm -hmm. quiet life. So unfortunately, along with being controlling, he was also physically abusive. I'm sure I didn't want to hear that. I'm sure we're all familiar with a famous photograph of Marilyn in the white dress standing over the subway grate where the wind blows her skirt up and she's trying to hold it down and she's laughing. I mean, that's probably like the most famous Marilyn photo I can think of. So that scene was for the movie The Seven Year Itch, and it was filmed on Lexington Avenue in Manhattan on September 15th, 1954. Joe DiMaggio was there on set that day to watch the filming. And I didn't know this until I was doing the research, but that whole scene, the the skirt flying up and all of that was a publicity stunt planned by the studio. They told everyone that that was going to happen. So they they're basically like putting the word out for some free publicity and thousands of fans and press photographers showed up to watch the film them film that scene. So Marilyn, she knew that this, you know, was going to happen. So she wore two pairs of white underwear that day because she knew everyone was going to see her underwear and girl just wanted to be prepared, you know, so she doubled up. A crew member is actually crouched in that subway grate with a fan to create the wind effect. Oh, wow. Which also, I don't know who the crew member was, but can you imagine being the person who like gets that assignment? They're underneath. Like, so you're going to stand underneath Marilyn Monroe while she's wearing this dress and you're just going to blow a wind machine to make her dress fly up. Like, I mean, it, it is true when, it, when the subways are passing, you're walking over one of those grates. I used to live in New York. Uh, oh yeah. My dress or skirt flew up many a time and I did not double up. So <laughs> I'm sure I gave a show to several passerbyers. Yeah. They, passerbyers, they, they, like, I always thought that that happened. Like I truly believed a, a subway train had gone across at that time when they happened yeah. to be shooting and like, oh, they happened to catch this. No, that was all 
a publicity stunt and planned. planned. So they shot 14 takes of the scene. The cr- 14? Yeah. The, which, honestly, I mean, yeah, that's a lot, but the the crowd was loving it so much. So, yeah. you know, they're giving them what they want. Um, the director, Billy Wilder, though, said that Joe had the look of death on his face. He was pissed. And he stormed off the set and went into the nearby St. Regis Hotel. Marilyn followed him. And it was there in suite 1105 that a heated argument took place and Joe beat her up. She had to call hair and, the hair and makeup team to come and fix her up so that they could keep shooting. So he's kind of a piece of shit. Aww. Three weeks later, she announced their divorce. And it was around this time that her drug use began to increase. And she was, you know, using that as a coping mechanism. Was there any uh, signs of, like, m- mental impairments uh by this time i i mean i feel like her she's at where her mom's age was when she was a little girl for sure and she was always worried that she would end up just like her mom Mm -hmm. her issues came more with the drug use like i don't really see any patterns of like manic or Mm -hmm. that kind of thing with her she she just had she had serious depression and became addicted to pills and by all accounts, like it, she didn't have the paranoid schizophrenia that ran in her family. Okay. So Marilyn was getting fed up with Hollywood. And aside from her marriage ending, she really wanted to be taken seriously as a dramatic actress. But the studio always put her in these, you know, the silly, Tight dumb test. blonde. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she was over it. She had a turbulent relationship with the head of the studio, Daryl Zanuck, probably because of how they started. He's the one that fired right. her. And he was the, uh, yeah, he was the one, I'm sure you remember, who did not think she was photogenic. But now right. she's their biggest star. So they just had a weird, it was, it was a bad vibe. Around this time, Marilyn had struck up a friendship with photographer Milton H. Green, whom she met on a photo shoot. And he became an important figure in her life. And they became very good friends. So she was ready to leave L.A. And with Milton's help, she got out of her contract with 20th Century Fox, moved to New York City, and the two of them formed Marilyn Monroe Productions, with Marilyn having controlling interest. So she owned 51% and was also going to be a a principal performer. And it's reported that she basically had to sneak out of L.A., I guess because she was so high profile. Mm -hmm. So she disguised herself by wearing a dark wig, and she went by the name Zelda Zonk. Oh my God, I have always wanted a moment to be able to go in disguise wearing like a tan jacket, (laughs) Sherlock Holmes style with a wig and a scarf. (laughs) You have to have the scarf, obviously. I have wanted to do that. And for for what moment? I have no idea. Would you go by the name Zelda? (laughs) Absolutely. Are you kidding me? (laughs) I like it. So Hollywood took this as a slap in the face and quickly turned on her. There was a lot of resentment towards her among the studio execs. And meanwhile, Marilyn began taking classes at the actor's studio with Lee Strasberg. Uh, yeah, she did. Yeah, but it wasn't great. So oh, no. she grew really close to Strasberg and his family and became the best of friends with his daughter, Susie. And Lee's wife, Paula, was also one of Marilyn's acting coaches. One thing Lee required of all his students upon joining the actor studio is that they begin psychoanalysis, which is just fucked up. <laughs> like what? when you think like your acting teacher is forcing you into psychoanalysis. What kind of psycho theater is this? So exactly. And and huge stars went there. Marlon Brando, Elia Kazan, like Ellen Burstyn. There were so many huge stars there. Did they all go through that? Yeah. So in all, Marilyn had three psychiatrists that she saw. Dr. Margaret Hohenberg. I don't know if I'm saying that right, hopefully. Dr. Marianne Chris and Dr. Ralph Greenson. In these psychotherapy sessions, Marilyn would be subjected to dredging up a lot of painful memories. Mm -hmm. Yes, particularly about her troubled childhood, including the sexual abuse she endured. I, I mean, I'm a therapeutic teacher, so obviously I'm going to endorse therapy. And I think oh, I'm it's so important therapy. for her. But to be forced to do something like this, be forced not to at your do own it. will, is – And to have that's three heavy. different yeah. doctors. And again, it's by your acting coach. Right. Like, what? 
So she often had trouble sleeping and felt depressed, and these doctors would prescribe her medication. Oh, the, oh this is where it's going. Yeah, see, mm. that's the thing. It was a vicious cycle because she's being forced to do this and dredge up all this stuff, and they're causing her a lot of like sleep deprivation and depression because you know they're making her bring up these painful memories that she's maybe not ready to bring up, right. and then they're giving met her medicine for it, which is contributing to her depression and all of that. So it's just, it's a vicious cycle. She'd already been known to abuse pills at this point, but I mean, now that she has three doctors who can write her prescriptions after a year of analysis in a journal, she wrote, help, help, help. I feel life coming closer when all I want is to die. Yeah. So now Strasburg believed that this suffering that he would put these students through was for the sake of the art, blah, blah, blah. Gross. It does seem that he liked his students to be self-doubting because it gave him more power over them. It gave him, yeah. Yep. And Marilyn grew really close to him and saw him as a father figure, so she was very devoted to him. And years later, Elia Kazan said that Strasburg had found the perfect victim devotee in Marilyn. You know... Okay, Stranger Things season four just came out a few weeks ago. Okay, but ago. don't tell me anything because I've only watched the first episode of it. I, I promise I won't because this is a theme running out okay, throughout the whole no show. Okay, just no spoilers. But th- this Marilyn Monroe, um, under the guise of this this uh, acting coach or professor or mm-hmm. whatever, is starting to remind me of the dynamic between Eleven and Papa. Oh, well, Yeah. And I am getting creeped out vibes. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder if that's like a thing. Like the Stranger Things, the Duff, Duffer Brothers, I believe, yeah, who wrote Stranger Things. I, like, are they Maryland fans? Did they, I mean, I don't know like that like whole thing. Any of that had anything to do with her, right? But, but I do it, see the similarities. Who knows? I do see. Yeah, the isn't that? It's. I mean, that's whack. Yeah, but, and it's gross. But also, it's on the, my brain, so I had to yeah. just get it. Well, out you there did watch. I'm like, the wow, season in one sitting. I, yeah, on the plane. <laughs> so. Um, Marilyn was very close to the Strasburgs. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but she did even live with them for a time. And in fact, she bequeathed, 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 bequeathed the majority of her belongings to Lee. So upon her death, he got almost everything. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, Confusing. she did not specify what should happen to these items upon Lee's death. So after Lee's wife, oh. Paula, died, because Paula died, I think, just a few years after Marilyn from breast cancer, if I'm not mistaken, he got remarried to a woman named Anna, who had no relationship with Marilyn. Marilyn didn't know Anna. So after Lee died, rather than Marilyn's estate going to Lee and Paula's children, like particularly Susie, because she was such good friends with her, right. it ended up with Anna. Who made millions? Off millions. Of it. She mm-hmm. auctioned off a bunch of items and sold Marilyn's likeness and products to big companies like Mercedes Benz and Coca Cola. So that's just shitty. Like, ain't that some shit? Seriously. Uh, I mean, she didn't even know her, but yeah. Oh, she she's a multimillionaire off of that. So it was during her time in New York that Marilyn reconnected with playwright Arthur Miller. They had met years earlier at a party and had hit it off, but he was married with kids and he and Marilyn lived on opposite coasts at the time. So like nothing, nothing super, you know, concrete came of that. But now that Marilyn was residing in New York, author, uh, author, I mean, he was Arthur, who was, (laughs) words are hard. (laughs) They really are, was much more interested in forming a relationship with her. And although he was still married, he and Marilyn began an affair. He divorced his wife shortly after and soon married Marilyn. She had converted to Judaism for him and Lee Strasberg. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Acting as her father figure gave her away in an intimate Jewish ceremony, which I. Marilyn Monroe Miller. Okay. Yeah. Um, Arthur gave her a ring with the inscription A to M, June 1956, now is forever. And on the back of their wedding photo, she wrote, hope, hope, hope. It's just like, oh. Just like help, help, help. But now we're at hope, hope, hope. Yep. Arthur saw a lot of potential in her. He felt she could be successful as a dramatic actress. Because again, like that was one thing she wanted more than anything was just to be taken seriously. And he also felt she was really intelligent and that her intellectual side just hadn't been cultivated. And she loved that he saw this in her. Like that's what 
that's how she wanted to be perceived is, you know, she did have a brain and she was a reader and she loved his intellect and his bookish nature. So the two were seemingly a good match at first. Oh, no. Here we go again. Unfortunately, the Sounds honeymoon like phase life. didn't last long. Shortly after they married, they flew to London so Marilyn could shoot The Prince and the Showgirl, which also starred Laurence Olivier, who produced and directed the film as well. Olivier did not get along with Marilyn. There was a lot of tension on set. Marilyn was often late. She kept Paula Strasberg, her acting coach, on set with her, and she wouldn't do anything without consulting her first. And it drove, it drove Laurence Olivier nuts. And he would refer to Mer- Marilyn as a bitch. And it was just, it was bad, bad vibes all around. Toxic. Not what mm-hmm. you want out of a day's work. Yeah. So during the course of filming, Marilyn and Arthur attended a party and afterwards, Marilyn found some notes that he had left just lying around. In them, he called her a whore. He said she was, quote, as flawed as his ex-wife. He was ashamed of her in front of his peers. And he said he had doubts about the marriage. So, wow. needless to say, Marilyn was devastated. Like, I don't, I don't know if he intended for her to find that or not. But why would you leave that lying around? Yeah. Like, that's weird to me. So one thing about Marilyn that a lot of people don't know is that she wrote a ton of poetry, especially when she started seeing psychiatrists, I think just because, you know, she has all these things coming up that she needs to get out. Just the thoughts, right? So when she found the notes from Arthur, she wrote several poems and she wrote them at the home where they stayed in London because it's on that stationery from there. And so this is, oh, this is just... It's heartbreaking. So this is one of the poems she wrote during that time. Where his eyes rest with pleasure, I want to still be, but time has changed the hold of that glance. Alas, how will I cope when I am even less youthful? I seek joy, but it is closed, closed, excuse me. I seek joy, but it is clothed with pain. Take heart as in my youth, sleep and rest my heavy head on his breast, for still my love sleeps beside me. My heart just felt that. I know. It just, uh, she was clearly hurting, but she remained committed to him and she wanted to start a family with him because at this time now, like having a kid was was number one in her life. Yeah. She, when she was younger, she never wanted kids. And now that she's older and she has some success, like it has become a priority for her. So after filming wrapped in London, they returned to the U.S., And they renovated the house that Arthur had previously lived in with his first wife, which is like, I don't know about that. Like, maybe that wasn't the best decision. Need a move. They they were going to just demolish it and then rebuild, but they didn't have the money. And so they're like, ah, we'll just fix this place up. And I'm like, "Mm, bad vibes. So they started trying for kids and she did get pregnant and she was pregnant while filming Some Like It Hot. And she said it was the happiest really? time in her life. Oh, yeah. You can you can see the bump in that movie. Um, unfortunately, though, she suffered a miscarriage. Um, she Another poem that she wrote, she wrote about a stay in the hospital. Uh, hospital and it's undated. But I feel like it's probably from around this time or shortly after. And it's a little more lighthearted and just kind of gives you a glimpse of not only how she used writing as a coping mechanism, but also her humor. So it's titled On Hospital Gowns. And it goes, my bare derriere is out in the air when I'm not aware. (laughs) I just love it. I love it. I love it. You know, I do feel like she goes through her life with humor and hope, which is how I go through life. So, and a little bit of love in there. I mean, it's a great way to be. Sometimes I have to say help myself. It's a great way to be. And and that's one thing that I, that I found is that people that worked with her and that knew her say she was just the nicest girl. Like Groucho Marx, he was like, oh, she was such a nice girl. So nice. (sighs) And I think, I think she had a lot of empathy too, because she went through Mm -hmm. some shit and she didn't like, to see other people in having to suffer yeah. and endure the shit things that happen in life. Yeah. So I just think you don't ever want to go about those things alone. No, it's just, I think it just, I think it's what partly gave her such a big heart. Um, mm-hmm. 
Meanwhile, though, Arthur couldn't stand the influence that Milton Green had over Marilyn. Now, that was her business partner in the production company. Milton and Marilyn were business partners and also very good friends. And Marilyn was good friends with Milton's wife, Amy, who did not like Arthur Miller. And about him, she once said, quote, I have never been so bored with a human being in my life. <laughs> I'm like, savage I've that girl. On a <laughs> I mean, she just, she did not see what Marilyn saw in him. So Arthur convinced Marilyn to part ways with Milton, which meant she would have to buy him out of his share of the production company. Wow. The 49%. Yes. So, wow. at, so at the final meeting of it, there were all these lawyers there to protect Marilyn's interests, which I'm sure were put in place by not her, but like by Arthur, by her team, you know, uh, because Milton asked for only half of his initial investment. He initially invested a hundred grand. He only asked for half of it back and reportedly was Marilyn whispered across the table to him, take more. And he said to her, no, let me be the one in your life to never take more. Oh, oh. Which I don't know if that quote actually happened because it feels a little flowery to me. Just like, ne never let me be the one in your life to take more, you know. <laughs> I don't know about that. But but I do feel like they had a really strong relationship. And I think she probably did want him to have his fair share. And also, like, that was her friend. And she's only right. doing this because the man she married is like, no, get rid of him. So although their partnership only lasted four years, they created some iconic photographs together, which a lot of them can be seen in that book, My Story. Um, I'm going to show them to you. Okay, so there's the ballerina photo, and I know you've seen this. I have to grab this book. Okay, I almost fell off the chair, but that's okay. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I stayed. Okay. They did this series together. Oh, I want to recreate that. I mean... I it's I th didn't Madonna recreate that. What's interesting is um, her costume, f f Marilyn's costume from the movie Bus Stop. Ma uh, Madonna wears that in her like a virgin video. Okay, I thought there was some kind of yep. like yep. tie in. Yep. Um, so the picture I'm showing Kaylee is it's she I almost said Madonna. Marilyn is in. Uh, she's seated. She's in like a white ballerina costume with like this huge tulle skirt and the back of it didn't close so she's actually holding the front of it up so that it doesn't fall off but they took a series of photos like that and think about like just fashionably or or um moreover like the um the way that she presented herself how many people have tried to emulate her oh yeah um she's an icon madonna i mean sex in the city that that looks like a picture of Carrie promoting. Yes. Sex in the yes. City, right? like, oh my God. I think it is. I think it's the exact same pose. So I didn't it, think about that. The way that it's been carried for so many years. And to be honest, I mean, they just put this Netflix um, yeah. documentary out and it, we, we are still writing on yeah. um, Marilyn Monroe's existence. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how much of an icon she really is. And we'll get into some of that documentary in part three. Because, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know if I mentioned, but there are three parts. <laughs> I just couldn't, I couldn't get it all into two. It just, there's too much. And I just feel like you, ah, it was hard. It was hard figuring out like what to keep in and what to leave out because there's just so much and it's fascinating. Yeah. And let me, t let me tell everybody who might be listening. Our one audience member, maybe. <laughs> it's but, <Matt>. um, <laughs> right. Shout out. Um, but I, Katie will not, like, we have decided previously, like, we are not looking at each other's notes when we do any, yeah. anybody or we have any stories. So I haven't seen any of these notes. And to be honest, even though Marilyn Monroe is just this figure out there that everyone has followed for so many years. Mm -hmm. And who I think is a badass, but I knew yeah. nothing really about her. And Same. I think that's actually better for me because this is all so raw for me. I I wish that we I wish you guys could see what my face looks like because <laughs> Katie gets to see that. And I have these reactions, like a squinched face and and like eyes wide open. It's all open. in your eyes. It's all in your I eyes. I know my eyes really do give away everything, but it, I am so shocked. I've, it's a shock value, like the the story, the backstory. I was fascinated about her life. because, yeah, I like I knew about Marilyn Monroe, obviously, like who doesn't? But 
especially reading my story, everyone, you have to go read that book. It is so good. Like, it's just cool to read about her life in her own words. And and she's got a sense of humor and she's she's really thoughtful and she's funny and and about a female in a man's world. Because oh, let's be honest, at that 100%. time, it, it, I mean, th- this is like, you know, the 50s, whatnot. Um, you know, women were meant to be in the kitchen, right? And she's already showing us so many times that's not her role. Yeah. Oh, she was a badass. She was a badass bitch. And I want to be just like her. <laughs> um, so, wh- okay, in this same book, um, One thing that's mentioned is that she wasn't really into buying clothes all the time. Like she just, it wasn't her thing. So she would often borrow from designers or like even from the wardrobe department of whatever production she was working on. But Milton said that there was one thing she always traveled with no matter what. And it was her white terry cloth robe. And I'm just like, oh, same. I get it. I'm going to show you this picture because it just... It's just like pure happiness and she just looks so content. She, I think this was probably like shot in some hotel room or that or something she stayed in and she's got her robe and her hair and makeup's done, but she's barefoot and it just looks like she's caught dancing around the room and she just looks so genuine and happy. So I'm just going to, I'm going to show this to Kaylee right here. Oh gosh. You know what? I don't have a robe, but um, <laughs> mom, if you're out there, first of all, I'm fine. I always have to tell my mom I'm fine. But <laughs> second good. of all, my birthday is coming up in July. So um, there you go. There you, you go. Get yeah. me a, a white terry cloth robe and I am going to just live it out. I, okay. Okay. So I will turn to shreds. I have a, like, it is one of my prized possessions. It is the softest coziest white robe and I got it at the gift shop at the Bellagio Hotel in Vegas when Matt and I were there for vacation oh my god so bouge I feel like I am at a spa every time I wear it take to the tub get out and put on that robe yes yes I love it so Arthur Miller, as we can see at this time like other men in her life he's becoming controlling he's telling her you know Hey, you need to cut ties with Milton, cut ties with Amy. And honestly, like, because I do think it's so hard. And I'll talk about it more in part three about the the men of her life, Joe and Arthur particularly, and the Kennedys. Don't worry, we'll talk about them. But um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. But they could not get over her. Like they never could. And honestly, I think Arthur had met his match with her. He wanted to be doted on. He was used to like women just falling at his feet because he's this, you know, renowned playwright. And she she was the one being doted on by the world at this time. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think he knew how to handle that. And I don't think he knew how to how to truly love her. And I think his ego got in the way. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, this sounds like pure ego issues. Oh, 100%. So the two of them both had relationships outside of the marriage. And Marilyn had a not-so-secret affair with her co-star Eve Montand while making a movie. The film was called Let's Make Love. And they did. <laughs> On screen and off. <laughs> it's also rumored. <laughs> it's rumored that one of her pregnancies was by Eve, not Arthur. But... That's not like officially confirmed, but it's a pretty widespread rumor out there. And the timeline would work out for that to be, I think, maybe her second pregnancy. So wow. it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, Marilyn said that Arthur knew of her affair with Eve, but that he didn't really care. He was just like, OK, which depressed her. Because of yeah. course she wanted him to care. Like if I of went to course. Matt, if I went to Matt and was like, hey, uh, me and Billy Bob over there, we're like uh, having a wild fling. I And he just shrugged his shoulders. You want a like, reaction. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd be pissed. So Marilyn, she did reportedly endure. And I, and because I say reportedly, because some sources will try to like dispute everything. But I, I do think that this happened. So she did endure an ectopic pregnancy as well as yet another miscarriage. So she never actually got to fulfill that dream of having children. Mm -hmm. Um, 
by this point, she was heavily abusing drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. She was depressed. She was in a loveless marriage. She had insomnia. And she was really beginning to spiral downhill. Uh, Sorry, I had to mute myself so I could cough. (laughs) Okay. Um, So... At one point in the relationship, Arthur said she did attempt suicide, which the press caught wind of, and there was a media circus. So he and Marilyn were hiding out in an apartment in Brooklyn where she tried suicide again. And he tells the following story to Franklin Gella, which, okay, Franklin Gella, like, he did just get fired from the project he was working on for inappropriate behavior. So, like, I just hate bringing up troubled men, but, or troublesome men, I should say. But this is, they did, Frank and Arthur did work together. And this is a story that he told to Frank during that, about that time. So Arthur said that with this next uh, suicide attempt of hers, um, he found a doctor in the phone book and was just like, hey, I'm Arthur Miller, my wife, you might have heard of her, Marilyn Monroe, she's not doing so great. And the doctor didn't believe it was him because like, who would, you know? Yeah. And so to prove it, Arthur goes down and meets him on the street. And the doctor, like, sees him. He's like, oh, shit, there's Arthur Miller. Like, wait a minute. So I guess I'm getting ready to go meet Marilyn Monroe. And Arthur brings him up to the apartment. And Arthur said that the doctor went in and just saved her life. And when he came out, said, you know what? She's going to be okay. And uh, 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 one more thing. Uh, uh, Could I get her autograph? Oh. Yeah. Oh. oh. I was like, okay. Oh. Dude, this woman almost died, and that is where your head is at. Arthur agreed. Listen. Arthur agreed. Your face just did five different reactions there. <laughs> I'm still trying to process. Yeah. Like, come on. He said he had to hold her hand to help her scribble her name because she was so uh, yeah. out of it. I mean, she just tried to take her life, and now we're signing autographs. hmm wild so despite their that's sad because it it is sad that's the thing there are so many there's so many enablers around her and oh it's just like man she didn't have a fucking chance like she didn't she didn't she was just everything was going against her at all walks of life when it's like two steps forward three steps back almost and and she's such a fighter and it's just it's like the people around her, oh, it, it just, it's heartbreaking. Well, and it, and it just shows so much selfish, like, behavior. And on, on, on their part. Yeah. Right, of course, on their part. Like, she just, you know, she attempted to take her own life. And, and the doctor asked autographs. for an autograph. Yeah, we're getting autographs. And it just shows, like, just this devaluing of life. I Give her a minute. My God. Yeah. <laughs> Despite their rocky relationship, Arthur Miller was developing a short story he had written into a, spring, a screenplay called The Misfits. And this was to be a vehicle. Uh, man, why can't I talk suddenly? This was to be a vehicle You're for a Marilyn. I am. <laughs> for Marilyn to showcase a more dramatic side. And he said he had written it as a gift to her because she had recently lost a baby in early pregnancy, uh, which I think that would have been her third which ended in miscarriage. And she was so depressed uh, that he wrote the misfits to give her something to cheer her up and also to show her how much he believed in her as an actress. So the film was shot primarily in Reno, Nevada and starred Marilyn, Eli Wallach, Montgomery Clift. And, uh, Oh, just just this one guy. um, His name was Clark Gable. Do do you remember, do you remember him? Um, I do. I remember him fondly and his mustache. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm. So, it's interesting because the movie is about a love triangle and Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe are love interest, but she saw Clark Gable, you know, as like kind of a, a father, figure father figure in a way. Hmm. And I don't it know. It seems like it's mirroring her life. Like she's it's had a real, affair, it's just so. kind of gives me the ick factor. Cause it's oh. Like, oh, and I don't know whose decision it was to cast him. I thought maybe it was hers, but she reported that she was terrified at the thought of working with him because he was like this. She he was just intimidating to her, you know. I'm never gonna look at Rhett Butler the same. I'm like, did did Arthur Miller want Clark Gable to play him? Him? Was that like kind of Hmm. a weird head fuck towards her? It's I don't know. It's interesting. Um, one note about the film I wanted to include that it's it's a little off topic, but it's 
fascinating. So there's a scene where Marilyn is naked in bed with a sheet over her and Clark Gable comes in and gives her a kiss and then leaves. Then she's supposed to get up and get dressed. So when they're shooting the scene and Marilyn gets up, she purposefully dropped the sheet before putting on her blouse. So she was completely exposed to the cast and crew. And the director, John Huston, was like, cut. Whoa, 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 whoa. you can't do that. You can't be nude on screen. Because the Hayes Act was in effect at this time, which was basically, well, it was the Hayes Code, I shouldn't say Act, which um, it was a self-governing code in the movie industry. And it had a shit ton of rules about what could and uh. could not be seen on screen. So they shoot another take. And once again, Marilyn Takes drops the off. sheet, exposing herself. And the director's like, Marilyn, stop dropping the sheet. And she's like, oops, my bad. Sorry. Just need to get some air. So they do another take. Again, she drops the sheet. So Houston's getting pissed. What's her motive here? I'm loving it. And he looks at her and she's like, look, you should let me drop the sheet. It's only going to help the movie. Which, I mean, yeah, Mm -hmm. she, she, Mm -hmm. that's a true statement. Even Clark Gable and other people on set were like, yeah, she should drop the sheet. And they would, and they were saying like, why would a woman, and this is the thing, why would a woman who is naked in bed get up to get dressed and keep herself covered while no one is in the room, mind you, and try to put on a blouse while holding a sheet over her. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Unrealistic. I hate it. So Houston, if he, if he had used one of the takes where she dropped the sheet, Marilyn, well, no, but Marilyn would have become the first American actress to appear nude since the Hayes code had gone into effect. And Marilyn said, you know, one day nudity on screen is not going to be a big deal, but I probably won't be around when that time comes. She was right. Just one year after her death, Jane Mansfield appeared topless in the movie Promises, Promises. I just thought that was so interesting. So while on set, things were not rosy, shall we say, to put it lightly. Marilyn was relying heavily on pills and alcohol to cope with the struggles in her personal life, and Arthur did not seem to make things any easier for her. For one thing, he was constantly rewriting rewriting the script as they shot the movie, so she's getting these last-minute changes all the time, and she found it difficult to remember the new lines. So she was often late, mainly due to her trying to learn the new lines last minute, and she had a lot of anxiety over it. And then Arthur also incorporated a lot of their personal lives into the film. So the Mm. arguments that they would have at home would end up on the screen, which is shitty because seeing your life unfold like that. Yeah. She's already dealing with a lot and then hash it. Exactly. She's having to relive it every day at work. In particular, when Marilyn's character Roslyn is preparing for her divorce hearing, Arthur Miller wrote the scene directly based on her real life di- divorce plea that she had filed against Joe DiMaggio. Damn. I mean, that's, that's just a slap in the face. Wow. I mean, that's fucked up. Mm-hmm. Things are getting bleak. Arthur and Marilyn began staying in separate suites while they were shooting. And Arthur began dating the film's uh, f- publicity photographer. Her name was Inga Morath. Probably said that wrong. And he met her on the set. And they later did get married. So yeah, it's I like mean, a Titanic ki- ki- kind of it's uh, just vibe there. Wild. Like he wrote Same this for Marilyn. Right. He he treats her like shit. She's having a hard time. He's not supportive by any stretch of the imagination. And then he starts seeing a woman that he met on that set. And then they get married. Like it's just a lot. So in August, of, repeating itself, it seems. You know? In August of 1960, production was shut down for two weeks because they were over budget. Partly because the director, John Houston, had exceeded his gambling allowance. He'd been given fifty thousand dollars to gamble while filming, and he blew it all and then some. Shit, that would pay off my student loans. Okay. I mean, fifty. I just I can't to gamble. Even. So yeah, exactly. So that two weeks was just studio execs in meetings trying to get things back on track. But rather than admit it was his gambling addiction that caused the delay in production, he convinced Marilyn's doctors that they needed to admit her to a hospital for her substance abuse and blamed the production delay on her. So she ended up going into a hospital. That's shitty. I mean, she does need help, but 
that's a really shitty way to do it. Yep. When she was released, she was so hollowed out. Like her skin looked horrible. Like she just, she did not look good. So all of her close-ups were heavily filtered. And you can tell. Like when I was watching this movie, Matt and I watched it, I don't know, like a couple, I don't know, it feels like a couple months ago. I was like, man, why? You know, actually. It didn't I look even, right. Yeah. And also I realized that Matt did not watch that movie with me. So I don't even know why I said that he was there because he was not. <laughs> <laughs> I was by myself. But anyway. But I could tell, like. I was like, Ghost man, love. why? Like, you could just tell there's so many filters on her. So in January of 1961, Marilyn and Arthur divorced before The Misfits was released. Marilyn chose this particular day because it was John F. Kennedy's inauguration. Oh. And she felt the media would be focused on that and there wouldn't be much attention on her. On her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, like I said, we'll get into the Kennedys in part three. So don't you worry. The Misfits was released on February 1st, 1961. Two weeks later, Clark Gable died of a massive heart attack. And because people are shit, many blamed Marilyn for his death, for- which is absurd. They said that it was her tardiness and her behavior on set that took a toll on him. Not um, his unhealthy behavior. Yeah, because I'm thinking it was more like the smoking four packs a day like, for 30 smoking, years. Everybody knew he smoked. Like, and all the excessive drinking that did him in. Right. Not to mention the fact he had already suffered, oh, I believe it was three heart attacks prior to his fatal one. So, I don't know. Just me. Like, I'm thinking maybe maybe it was that. Maybe not Marilyn. So, shortly after The Misfits was released... One of Marilyn's psychiatrists had her admitted to Payne Whitney Psychiatric Clinic, but they told her she was just going in for rest. She didn't know that she was going into a psychiatric facility. God, people deceive her left and right. I know. It's, oh, it's so fucked up. So while she was there, she wrote the following letter to Lee and Paula Strasberg, and I just have to read it because, oh boy. So it says, Dear Lee and Paula, Dr. Chris has had me put into the New York Hospital Psychiatric Division under the care of two idiot doctors. They both should not be my doctors. You haven't heard from me because I'm locked up with all these poor nutty people. I'm sure to end up a nut if I stay in this nightmare. Please help me, Lee. This is the last place I should be. Maybe if you called Dr. Chris and assured her of my sensitivity and that I must get back to class so I'll be better prepared for rain— so Rain was a project that Lee was um, a part of to direct. Okay. It ended up not ever happening, but that's what she's talking about, getting back into acting class. Lee, I tried to remember what you said once in class, that art goes far beyond science. And the scary memories around me I'd like to forget, like screaming woman, etc. Please help me. If Dr. Chris assures you I am all right, you can assure her I am not. I do not belong here. I love you both. Marilyn. P.S. Forgive the spelling. There is nothing to write on here. I'm on the dangerous floor. It's like a cell. Can you imagine? Cement blocks. They put me in here because they lied to me about calling my doctor and Joe, and they had the bathroom door locked, so I broke the glass. And outside of that, I haven't done anything that is uncooperative. So that's the letter that she sent to her acting coaches while she was locked up. My mouth is a jar, just to put that out there. It is. It is a jar. To my knowledge, Arthur Miller never visited her while she was in the hospital. I mean, they were divorced at this time, but still, like, it was fresh, you know? Uh, But you want to know who did visit her? Oh, just uh, just a little man named uh, Joe DiMaggio. Joe's back? Joe is back! In fact, Joe was the one who convinced the doctors to release her and have her transferred to a regular medical facility, which was a much better situation for her. So, like... Mm. He was a shit, but like also he did some good things. It's like, okay. I'm like DeMouthio here. My mouth is open even wider now. (laughs) (laughs) DeMouthio. Once she was out of the hospital, she got back to work and she was making plans to start an independent production company with Lee Strasberg and Marlon Brando, who, uh, Brando was also a student of Strasberg's and she did date him briefly and they remained good friends until she died. So, she was also getting to work on a movie. I mean, see, she's trying to get back on track. She's That's trying right. to every she's time. A fighter. She's a fighter. So she started filming the movie. Something's got to give. During this time, her L.A. psychiatrist, Dr. Greenson, had to go out of town. That is a decision that has been scrutinized a lot because typically the doctor would not leave town when his client was starting a huge job like this. 
So, so she he, didn't. He was more of like a Hollywood psychiatrist. That yeah, he was on set. If he was her LA whatnot. psychiatrist, okay. and okay. and you know she she relied on him a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marilyn ended up getting fired from the produ- production due to her behavior caused by the drug use, mm. but she was rehired. Unfortunately, though, she died before filming could be completed, making The Misfits the final film for both her and Clark Gable. On August 4th, 1962, at the age of 36, Marilyn Monroe was found lifeless, lying nude on her bed in her Hollywood home with a phone in her hand and a bottle of pills on the nightstand. And in the next part, we'll get into the mystery that surrounds her death because it's not all cut and dry. There are discrepancies in the timeline of how things went down that night, as well as discrepancies in the accounts of people who were supposedly there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we will be talking a lot about those Kennedy brothers. Because I know people are like, wait, you have not mentioned the affair. But I wanted this part to focus mainly on her marriages and career because I do think there are some patterns there that affected her mental and physical health. And she, like I said, she was surrounded by a lot of enablers. So I really wanted to get into that for this episode. And since part three will focus specifically on her death and some of the theories behind it, the Kennedys play a major, 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 play a major. The Kennedys play a major role in that no matter which way you look at it. So I'm saving them for part three. Wow. I cannot wait. I know. I hope that our listeners can't wait. I hope they tune in for part three. That concludes part two. Dos. I'm glad that you did say do. Uh, I do have a little something special for us. <gasps> I want to hear it. Okay. So <laughs> uh, you, you covered. sounded unsure. <laughs> so you covered that she was a reader and that um, Marilyn, you know, had a lot of books and that honestly, you know, I think she was more intelligent than people gave her credit for. Oh, absolutely. She absolutely so was. I looked up just on a couple of um, articles about um, how do readers choose books, right? Like I was mm-hmm. wondering, I'm like, what kind of books did Marilyn read? I mean, the Marilyn, what what did she read? Fiction, you know, nonfiction, you know, was she a sci-fi reader? I mean, I was she read very everything. curious about this. So, um, how people choose books. Now, this is just one, um, you know, response. Uh, yeah, like one survey, right? Sure. And sixty percent of people said that they pick genre. They pick a book by the genre, right? Yeah, twenty five percent because of the author. Like, let's think about it. J.K. Rowling had okay. a yeah. series of books. You know, all right, two percent only pick it by the review. Two okay. percent choose because of all three. Okay, and then other was eleven percent. But I thought this was interesting because this is how Marilyn Monroe chooses a book. Tell me. (laughs) She had over 400 books in her personal library, as we've Mm -hmm. discussed. She was asked how she picks a book, and she replied by saying that she goes to a bookstore and picks a book at turns and turns it at random paragraph. If she liked the paragraph, she would purchase the book. I love it. I love that. I like She's just like, hmm. How about you? And it's kind of like how people pick wine bottles, like based on their label or their name. And I get it. I mean, it's it's kind of this aesthetically pleasing moment. But for her, it was like what how the words were written, which put a play into her being um, a poet, right? And and her kind of oh yeah, expressing herself through words. So I just I loved that. I thought that was like I'm now I'm sitting here thinking like okay wait how do I pick out a book. Right. I feel right. like I feel like I do like lean towards a certain genre, but then I all I do feel like I will open it randomly. And this is just me trying to say that I'm just like Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I'll open it randomly and be like, oh, yeah, this sounds good. OK, that was good. I'll get it. Well, I thought it was really, uh, I guess, an interesting fact because this is uh, like picking a podcast, right? I mm-hmm. mean, I like to do a lot of true crime podcasts. Oh, and- yeah. So I just, I was like, wow, we can, we can really um, navigate life by certain different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Where we pick to live. And I I just loved the fact that, you know, words were so important to her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That's the thing. Like no one really, I say no one, I don't know. I I, I should just say for myself, I never knew that she 
was a writer and and that she studied so many different subjects and that she was really like doing the damn thing, you know? Right. Well, girl power. I don't know. Girl power. <laughs> she was a badass bitch. Um, so well, it's bitch o'clock at this household. It's so bitch o'clock, baby. <laughs> let's get it going. <laughs> well, I hope that you like this episode. I hope you tune in for part three where we talk about some of the theories surrounding her death. And in the meantime, you can, and I swear, hopefully by this episode, no, by this episode, we will have stuff posted for sure. Um, but you can check us out on Instagram at Horrorwood Podcast. Uh, that's H-O-R-R-O-R-W-O-O-D podcast. You spelled it right this time. Yay. I'm doing better. <laughs> and okay. Is it a Facebook page or a Facebook group that we have? I think Facebook right now it's a page, page. but mm-hmm. I think we should maybe change it to a group. But anyway, okay. that's also at Horrorwood Podcast. And we are on Twitter at Horrorwood Pod minus the cast. So just at Horrorwood Pod. And come also tweet at us. Come twit at us. Just kidding. I'm never going to post on the Twitter. Let me be honest. I'll, okay. I'll do Instagram and Facebook. But... I'm going to try to post on Twitter just okay. because I did make the account and I feel That'll like I should. <laughs> I, I'm so you can bad twit. at social media. Twit? I don't so know. bad. Um, and then I we did set up an email. And I think it's, you know what, I might have to look at it right now. I'm pulling it up right this second. It is, got to put in my password. Something horror, horror, uh, horror, horror. I want to say, horror. I'm about horror to find it right this moment. It is horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. Oh, that's easy. Oh, easy. So send us a little message message. And uh, that's that's it for today. Bye. Bye for now. Keep on being a misfit. Keep on being a misfit. I feel like that's a country song. <laughs> Keep on being a misfit. I mean, no. it, is, it is with you singing it. <laughs>